This is a special presentation of the U.S. Senate debate, hosted by New York One. Good evening and welcome from the Sage College's Bush Memorial. Memorial. Tonight's Senate debate is being shown all across the state on New York One News, YNN, and New York One Noticias, as well as being simulcast on WNYC Radio in New York City and Radio 900 AM here in the Capital Region. Our panelists tonight who will join me in the questioning are the host of YNN's Capital Tonight, Liz Benjamin, New York One Albany reporter, Aaron Billups, Juan Manuel Benitez of New York One Noticias, and Devlin Barrett, who covers Congress for the Wall Street Journal. Let's now introduce the two candidates who are running to fill the final two years in the Senate term that Hillary Clinton was elected to in 2006. And the order in which they are standing and speaking was determined earlier today by a coin toss. And so we welcome Joseph Diaguardi. Kirsten Gillibrand. All right, and we now begin with one minute opening statements, and we start with Ms. Gillibrand. This election is about who we fight for. I'm troubled about the number of New Yorkers who have lost their jobs and can't find work. I'm worried about middle class families who are really struggling to make ends meet. And I'm worried about small businesses that don't have the capital they need to create jobs. My opponent has a different view. He supports the same failed trickle down economics of the Bush administration. He wants to privatize Social Security. He doesn't support a women's right to choose or women's rights. And he's someone who wants to give tax breaks to the top 2% of wealthy Americans and borrow $700 billion from China to pay for it. I have a different vision for New York. I want to see Made in America right here. I want to stop outsourcing good American jobs. I want middle class tax and tax cuts for small business. We need to make sure that we have the economy that's working for all New Yorkers. This election is about transparency, it's about accountability, and it's about who we fight for. All right, Mr. Diaguardi. Thank you. New Yorkers are worried about one thing, jobs. Unfortunately, Senator Gillibrand's job creation plan spent money we don't have and is now forcing us to borrow from countries that we don't trust. She added to the national debt saying that the expenditures were justified because they would create jobs. They didn't. Now she has a new jobs creation program that is kind of rehashed legislation, 40% of which she didn't support when it was first introduced. Senator Gillibrand is jeopardizing the American dream. Uh, she failed to halt the rising cost of health care. She's creating uncertainty with the tax code. And she's promoting oppressive regulation on the business community. My jobs creation program is rooted in the private sector, infrastructure development, and incentives for business. I think <clears throat> there's a big difference here. I can assure you that when I get to Washington, I will rock the boat, something that she has not done. The closest she has done to rocking the boat is flip-flopping on every issue of importance to New Yorkers. All right, okay? Mr. Diaguardi. Please visit joyjoe2010.com <laughs> com to learn more. Your time is up, thank you. All right, uh, I will start with tonight's questioning. Answers will be limited to 60 seconds, rebuttals will be 45 seconds, and at the questioner's discretion, re-rebuttals uh, will last 30 seconds. And so the first question goes to Ms. Gillibrand. Uh, as a congresswoman two years ago, you voted twice against the federal bailout bill known as TARP. It was intended to prevent financial markets from collapsing and, and to keep credit from freezing. You broke ranks with the majority of the New York delegation, the congressional delegation, and, and most Democrats on this key issue, leading some to believe that your vote was politically motivated. So I ask, uh, why did you vote against the Democratic majority on this rescue package? Well, I've always been an independent voice for New York, someone who fights for our constituents and New Yorkers every time. And when I reviewed the legislation, I had a significant concern. And the concern was that there wasn't appropriate oversight 
or accountability or transparency with that legislation. In fact, there was no way to actually hold banks accountable when taxpayer money was put at risk. There was no way to say you can't pay bonuses, you can't pay dividends, and you actually have to lend. And what we found out is, in fact, that was one of the fundamental flaws of the legislation. And so my concern was is that the taxpayers would have been left holding the bag. Uh, just a follow-up. Uh, on balance today, many economists say that uh, TARP was actually uh, more successful than not. Um, and it, the actual cost to taxpayers was a lot less than predicted. Do you have any regrets? No, not at all. The legislation was fundamentally flawed, and so a lot of these issues we had to do in retrospect. We had to try to stop bonuses, stop dividends, making banks lend, and that caused enormous disruption. It caused enormous instability uh, because you had to do it retroactively. So my vote was the right vote, and some of the things we did differently than the actual legislation prescribed, ultimately we did invest in institutions and made sure that the PAC taxpayer was whole at the end of the day. Mr. Diagrati? Well, she voted for the stimulus plan, and she's been conveniently the 60th vote that the Obama administration has needed for massive legislation, whether it was the health care plan uh, that didn't reduce the cost of medicine or health care, and the Wall Street regulation plan that shot that industry in the foot, and therefore, Albany, since we rely on that industry now to balance the budget. So it's clear that she's not independent from the Democratic administration, and um, perhaps she had one diversion, but that's it. Do you have a rebuttal? Uh, only the fact that my opponent addressed the issue of a different bill. He addressed the Recovery Act, not the TARP. The, the stimulus, not the Correct. TARP. All right, let's move Which on. Which much bigger. Uh, and uh, we want to go now to our panel, and uh, Liz Benjamin, who has a question for Mr. Diaguardi. Mr. Diaguardi, you just brought up the issue of independence and, and assailing the senator's independence. Um, you have said in the past that Ronald Reagan was the best president that we have had in the past hundred years. You've been endorsed by uh, the late president's son. Can you point to uh, some time when you were in the House when you broke significantly with the administration, uh, the Reagan administration, in a significant vote? And also going forward, assuming that you had gone, you will go to the Senate. How can you ensure that you will be independent from the House leadership, or pardon me, Senate leadership, um, and particularly since this is a Democrat-dominated state? Well, Ronald Reagan could not count on my vote for everything. In fact, you may remember the headlines in the New York Times, the New York section, when they were lobbying me heavily for the MX missile, and I said no. Uh, this is a missile that's stationary. Russia already had SS-19s and 20s, and therefore I would not vote for that. So that's a clear issue where I was needed on a vote that I didn't give it to our president. And show my independence. Your independence in the Senate going forward? Assuming well, that you went to the Senate, how would you ensure that you were actually, New York of course is mostly Democratic, you are a Republican, that you were actually adequately representing most Democrats and most voters in New York? I will represent my constituency as I've always done. Uh, you may recall my first district had four Democrats to a Republican. I ended up with the largest minority of any Republican in America, the bottom part of Westchester County. And you can be sure that I was attentive to all my constituents at that time, and I will do the same as a U.S. Senator. So you, you feel that you could actually break this sort of partisan divide that has had sort of gridlock in Washington, and you would be willing to vote across the aisle with Democrats? I've done that, and I look for Democrats who are clear thinkers, honest people, who you can sit down with and break bread and figure out what's important for America. I've done that with Tom Lantos for four years on human rights, afterwards as an activist, volunteer. Uh, I've done it with Mr. Conyers, who's now chairman of the Judiciary Committee. He carried my legislation to bring chief financial officers to the U.S. government. I'm the kind of person who sits down with people on the other side of the aisle because we have to benefit America. Parties are not working the way they should. 
And Senator, similarly, we heard um, Mr. Diaguardi sell your independence. Since you've gotten into the Senate, um, aside from the vote on TARP, you really have are beholden in large part to the Obama administration and to Senator Schumer for protecting you from having a primary this fall. Uh, can you point to any significant vote on which you differed from the senior senator and the Obama administration? And going forward, how will you ensure your independence, assuming that you're elected on November 2nd? Well, I am an independent voice for New York, and I've always represented my constituents. And my view on these issues is I don't take a back seat to anyone, and I will always fight for New Yorkers in every single way. Uh, but I think it's a false question, because Senator Schumer and I, we share a lot of core values. We both believe that middle class families need tax cuts. We both believe that small businesses need a chance to create those jobs. We both believe that every New Yorker should have an opportunity for a college education. And so really the question isn't where we differ, and I'm, I'm glad that Senator Schumer agrees with me so often, but uh, it's not really the issue or the test of, of what a senator needs to do. And in fact, uh, having Senator Schumer and I work together on a lot of issues has made a difference. It's been a powerful combination for New York that we can fight together for New Yorkers and have a greater voice in the U.S. Senate. But if you do want to look at differences, sometimes we have different approaches. On one bill, uh, I wanted to have a payroll tax deduction of 15 or 20 percent so that uh, small businesses could create jobs. He favored a different amount. And so, you know, sometimes we do differ on approach. But is there any one significant vote in particular where you broke from the Obama administration or from Senator Schumer? Well, the TARP vote's one example where we had different votes. But in the Senate? In the Senate, there are some votes that are different. There was one vote about uh, priorities for making sure that charitable uh, deductions could be taken for, uh, and are you asking about the Obama administration or Senator Schumer? Well, for Senator Schumer, we had a different approach on whether you can take, uh, whether Recovery Act money could go to charities. And a similar issue with the Obama administration, they felt that there was a loophole that needed to be closed with regard to charitable deductions. And I didn't think that was a loophole that should be closed. In fact, I see it as something that incentivizes giving to charities. For example, um, many people give to our museums, our education centers, our cultural centers, uh, our music uh, centers in New York, and it's one of our main major economic engines. It's one of the greatest economic growth engines we have in the city and around the state. And I didn't think that that deduction should be removed. I also had a different approach uh, with President Obama on repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell. I disagreed with his um, lack of interest in making sure that we don't uh, appeal the decision by the court that said it was unconstitutional. And I would have made uh, immigration reform a major priority in the last Congress. You're talking about the ACORN funding bill? Is that what you were talking about? The Recovery Act bill, there was a provision in it that basically said um, money from the Recovery Act couldn't go to charities and museums and art centers, and I voted differently than my colleague. All right, thank you. Uh, and now we go to Erin Billups, who has a question for Ms. Gillibrand. Erin. Ms. Gillibrand, you just touched on this a little bit, but yesterday a federal appeals court temporarily stalled a judge's decision that would allow openly gay recruits to be accepted into the military. While President Obama says he wants the policy to end, he argues that military rules should be set by the president and by Congress, not judges. Can you further explain whether or not you agree with him? Well, my view is this is a law that needs to be changed, and that's why I've worked over the last year and a half to repeal this very corrosive and discriminatory policy. We're basically telling men and women who want nothing but to serve this country and possibly die for this country that they can't based on who they love. And it's been very undermining to military readiness because what we've basically done is we've dismissed 13,000 personnel. We've lost more than 10% of our foreign language speakers. We've lost more than 800 in mission critical areas that cannot be easily replaced. And so my view is this is a policy that we must, re must repeal mm -hmm. legislatively because it is a law. Uh, but I do support these decisions by courts because they are making the determination that it's unconstitutional to have a policy that limits a person's right to speech and due process. Because you're saying you cannot tell your commanding officer who you are, who you love, what the most important thing to you is. And fundamentally this policy undermines the entire integrity of our military. And that's why I've been so passionate about trying to make sure we can repeal this policy this year. So you're saying you don't care, you, you just want to see the policy repealed even if it's determined by just one person? We, this policy must be repealed. It's a law, so the appropriate avenue to do it is through Congress, 
but I would be happy if the law wasn't being enforced in the interim because I don't want to lose one more soldier to this very corrosive discriminatory policy. I say on this, what's the hurry? We know that the military is examining this right now. And you can be sure if there's a consensus that I would agree with that. I've had a very fine eight-year Jesuit education, very progressive people. I want to see every human being fulfill their potential. And I don't think there should be any discrimination on anything, whether it's civil, economic, political, human rights. But this issue has to be examined in the context of what these generals might see as a national security issue. And why not wait until there's a consensus? Whatever that consensus is, I will agree with. Mr. Diaguardi, if you were in the military, would it bother you to know if someone fighting beside you were gay? Not at all. Not at all. So personally. If it does, if personally. It, Okay. If it doesn't bother you, why should it bother any other soldier? Well, you know, the military is a structured institution, and we have generals that are experts on how that environment works. Let them see this from the top, and let there be a consensus. Whatever that consensus is, Jody Aguadi will agree with. Do you have a rebuttal? Yes, the military has spoken on this issue. We had multiple hearings in the Armed Services Committee in the Senate, hearings that I, in fact, asked uh, Chairman Levin to host so we could develop a record about what the military thought about this policy. And Chairman Admiral Mullen, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, testified that not only could the military handle such a repeal, that he had no question that our men and women who serve this nation could implement such a repeal, but he said that it fundamentally undermined the entire integrity. So we have heard from the military. And the report to which my opponent's referring to, that will come out, but it's about how to implement repeal. It's not a question of whether or not to implement. That is Congress's role, and we will repeal this policy, and I will work very hard to make sure we do it as soon as possible. But we all know that the Justice Department, within 60 days, will appeal that decision. So in this way, she's not waiting for her own president. She wants to go forward. I think this is wrong. I think that the consensus we want is more than one general there are many. Let them review this. Let's make sure there are no national security implications, and I don't think there might be either. But whatever that decision is, I will accept. All right. Thank you all. Uh, and now we go to uh, Juan Manuel, who has a question for Mr. Diaguardi. Thank Juan you, Roma. Uh, Mr. Diaguardi, and the New York City Department uh, of Education is poised to release in the, uh, in, to the public in the coming weeks teacher data reports. Uh, based on the students' scores on state tests. Uh, that is, we're talking about um, the names of, uh, and scores of 12,000 public school teachers uh, from grades 4th uh, through 8th. Do you think these names should be public or just included in an internal document? I think that when it comes to education, which is one of the most important things we need in America for the future, we need to be transparent. We need to make sure that people are doing their job. Did you see the report two weeks ago? It's incredible to me that from K to 12, the United States is now 48th in the world. In high school, we're number 20, and overall, we're number 12. Hey, I thought we were the number one country in the world trying to protect the American dream, trying to promote democracy. If you can't become number one or close on education, you're not going to succeed. And we have to do all we can to get performance. And if it requires publishing names, so be it. But let me tell you something. The federal government should push more education back to the states. I think that's an area that's got to be reformed as well. So uh, you would fire uh, these teachers uh, after publishing, uh, publishing uh, their names in, in this well, list? Or would what, you... what are they being accused of? I haven't seen this report. What, what's the, well, the judgment? Well, they, they would be um, graded, basically. They would get a grade based on how well their students performed on state tests. What's wrong with performance? I think performance is one of the most important indications of what people do and how education is proceeding. And if they have failed to perform, I think there has to be some action taken. Senator? I don't know about the report to which you're referring, uh, but clearly education in this country and in our state needs reform. We need to make sure that every child has an opportunity to reach his or her God-given potential by having a good education. So what I've focused on over the last year and a half is uh, 
issues of affordability, access, and quality education. Affordability is a very real issue for early childhood education, making sure young children have the opportunity to go to a good daycare so by the time they start kindergarten they're ready. Uh, and accessibility and affordability on a college level as well. But uh, in Washington, we've been focused but on race. Senator, with all due respect, would you publish the names of I these teachers? I don't teachers? know what you're talking to, to about, so I can't give you Imagine that an you answer. have uh, uh, teachers graded um, based on students' scores. I don't uh, think names should tests. be published. I, you don't I mean, think so? In the abstract, not referring to the facts, because I don't know what you're talk, referring to specifically, but I don't know what the good of that would be uh, to make teachers to be scapegoats for failures in school. I think we need accountability across the board. I think we may have to make sure that when we look at education policy, we look at the whole problem. And so, for example, one of the best successes we have in our state is Say Yes to Education in Syracuse. And in that school district, one of the highest poverty levels in the state, and very difficult public schools. We brought the parents to the table, we brought the teachers to the table, we brought the administrators, the local uh, businesses, and uh, Syracuse University to come together and say let's solve mm -hmm. the problem. And, and that is an approach yeah. I think is more useful than trying mm -hmm. to... May I comment, yeah. Yeah, and May I just comment on the status of education in New York yes, State? Yes, but one, one, before you, you come with your rebuttal, if your kid, um, if, if your kid's teacher was in this list with a bad score, would you try to um, get a different teacher uh, for your kid? Well, why should I take the place of a qualified administrator who has responsibility for monitoring what teachers are doing and their performance? I, I think that would be ludicrous. I, I would want my children to be taught by people who could, be, who could perform. But the big problem we have in New York State, Juan Manuel, is we have school taxes that are burying this state. The tax rate of this state is 70% higher than the national average of all the other states, and that includes property taxes and school taxes. You need to start consolidating school districts. You need to reduce the cost of administration and put it back into educating the kids. This state is going nowhere with this kind of a situation. It's got to be changed. Thank you. All right, thank you all. Uh, and we go now to Devlin. He has a question for Ms. Gillibrand. Devlin. Thanks, Roma. Ms. Gillibrand, U.S. counterterrorism officials are heavily engaged right now in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. They're also increasingly concerned about Yemen and Somalia. In which of these countries do you think the United States should be doing more? And in which of these countries do you think the United States should be scaling back? And I have one minute. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I have very grave concerns about what's happening in Yemen and Somalia. Uh, we are, you know, the last a terror attempt on New York City in Times Square came from Yemen. So I do have very real concerns about what we can do to address terrorism that's emerging from those countries. And, and we don't have a significant, uh, certainly not a military presence there now, and I'm not advocating for one, but we have significant concerns there. With regard to Iraq, we will be drawing down troops from Iraq over the next year, and all the troops will be out, and I think that is the right approach. With regard to Pakistan, we have, um, you know, we work with the Pakistani government, but we need far more accountability. We don't know where the money goes that we give to Pakistan, and we don't have the oversight and accountability to know that it's going in ways to be most productive. In Pakistan in particular, I worked to make sure that when we, we do invest money that we're preventing terrorism from growing, particularly in the border regions where the unemployment for men are very high, and so we want to prevent them from becoming the terrorists of tomorrow. And in Afghanistan, we have a very serious issue about how to address Afghanistan. I did vote in the Senate uh, to put an end date on our deployment in Afghanistan at the end of next year. I was one of 18 senators to do that. But the tough questions with regard to Afghanistan uh, are, can we be successful in a counterinsurgency strategy with a partner who's unreliable as Karzai? And Just fundamentally, that's the question the administration is going to be asking over and over again. Time is up. Time is up. Go ahead, Devlin. I guess what I was trying to get at is, what is what, in your mind, what are the priority countries in this struggle. In fighting terrorism, you have to have a worldwide approach. There is no silver bullet in preventing terrorism from attacking our country, from attacking our state. And so one thing I've, I've spent a lot of time in is, is future risks. One in particular is cyber crime and cyber terrorism. Uh, right now we have unbelievable risks and, and cyber attacks on this country that could result in a devastating attack. I mean, imagine a terrorist group shutting down the electric grid in the middle of winter. Think of how many seniors 
lives could be put at risk. Uh, imagine all the types of things that can happen. So in fighting terrorism, we have to be extremely proactive. We have to look for the risks where they emerge, and we have to invest resources as appropriate. But we do need to make decisions. You can't commit troops in every uh, arena around the world, in every theater around the world. So you have to be strategic. And sometimes investments are better made towards prevention, uh, you know, in terms of job creation, education for women, those kind of ideas. How could you forget Iran? Iran is threatening he Israel. He actually didn't ask about Iran. He gave me five. Oh, is that? Yeah. I, I think you have to add one that is really a rogue state, threatening our best ally in the region, Israel, going to the border, taunting Israel, supporting Hezbollah, supporting Hamas, a state that now wants a nuclear weapon. I mean, we've got a big, big problem with Iran. But let me say this. You know, now that we know the real facts about Iraq, that was a big mistake. We should never have declared war. All right, they wanted to, the Bush administration felt that was the way it should then define itself with 9-11. Same thing now. Why did President Obama take the Afghanistan war and escalate it? Just to be clear, are, is your argument that Iran is more important from a national security point of view than Afghanistan? Right now, let me tell you, Afghanistan is not the problem. It's Pakistan. We have redefined or defined that whole area wrongly. Pakistan has 200 million people. Afghanistan has 50 million people. You've got a problem with India and Pakistan with insecure borders in Kashmir. Pakistan has insecure borders with Afghanistan. Karzai is a crook. He almost got away with $4 billion to Dubai. We caught him. His brother's a known criminal. Why do we have to declare war on a country to go after terrorists? We have the drones, we have 16 intelligence agencies, we have combat troops, and guess what? We're spending $100 billion this year in Afghanistan, and $50 billion is on bridges and roads. What about bridges okay, and roads I know in my York? minute's up. I know my okay. minute's up. Yeah, I'm sorry, we have but to break this up. let's not forget Iran. They all want right. a nuclear weapon. Can, can I all right, so respond on Iran? 30 or? seconds, that's all. Okay. Um, I do think Iran's goal of militarizing their nuclear capability is a significant and even existential risk, not just to Israel, but to the U.S. Because what we have seen from Iran is time and time again, they supply their military technology to our enemies. They give it to Hamas, they give it to Hezbollah, and they give it to Al-Qaeda. So one of the gravest threats we face in America today is the threat of a dirty bomb. Having a dirty bomb go off in Times Square, in a shopping mall, in a coliseum. And the reality the reality is that we have to use every bit of power we have to make sure that they do not acquire right. militarized nuclear weapons. Right. Thank I you. Agree. Th thank you very much, and thank you, Devlin Barrett of the Wall Street Journal. It is time now for what we call the cross-examination of the night. That's when each candidate gets to question uh, his and her opponent, and responses will be 60 seconds long. Ms. Gillibrand, uh, we start with you, questioning Mr. Diaguardi. Mr. Diaguardi, in our last debate, yes. in, my la in our last debate, you said you have never changed your views on anything in your life. So I'd like to ask about Social Security. Uh, you said in your book, which I didn't read the whole thing, but you did say in your book that you did say in your book that you uh, believe that privatizing Social Security is the smart way to go. And I want to know if you still hold that view. Page 70. At this time, <laughs> let me say this. You're talking about the book in 1992. That was the original book. And we were looking for all kinds of options. And it should be considered as an option at that time. You cannot consider that as an option today. You would have to divert money that is FICA taxes from the account that is now, for the first time in 40 years, taking in less money than it's putting out. It's called the Social Security Trust Fund which is really a misnomer. There is no trust fund. It was a big Ponzi scheme. It should never have been named that. People have gotten elected saying that they were going to protect it. It was a trust fund, and, and it's not. So what I'm telling you now is that you can't do anything to divert any income that's coming in from Social Security without damaging it further. All right. And uh, Mr. Diaguardi, it's uh, your turn to ask a question of Ms. Gillibrand. Well, you know, you have, over the course of our debate, 
uh, tried to conceal the fact that you were a government official working with HUD and one of the people who played a key role in promoting these subprime mortgages. Uh, furthermore, you spent a good part of your legal career uh, with the tobacco industry, or at least with the law firm advising them. And at one point, uh, you structured a program so that they would take documents offshore away from the Freedom of Information Act as the executives from Philip Morris, your client, and others were perjuring themselves in front of the House. Now, you know, we were trying to find out at that time, is nicotine addictive? addictive? Are cigarettes causing cancer? And your actions frustrated that. Now, you say that you are transparent. How can you say you are transparent if you wanted to hide these facts from the American people just to get elected? Uh, Mr. Diaguardi, your allegations are entirely absurd uh, and really quite ludicrous. Um, take them one by one. Uh, at HUD, I did not work on subprime mortgages. I didn't work on mortgages at all. In fact, what I worked on was American Private Investment Companies Act, which was proposed legislation that would have taken public and private money and invested them in low-income areas to create jobs and to build infrastructure in, in at-risk and low-income areas. With regard to tobacco, the record could not be clear. My votes are clear. I have a 100% anti-tobacco, pro-health voting record, which you do not. In fact, your voting record is the exact opposite. You voted twice in favor of tobacco, once not to tax it, and once to give it subsidies. Whereas I voted to put a tax on tobacco because it's one of the best ways uh, by raising the rate to keep kids from smoking, and I voted to make sure that they were fully regulated. So your allegations about tobacco are absurd. Well, I was a young associate working at a big firm. I certainly didn't pick and choose my clients. And time. the story about documents, my job was to produce the documents time, time to the is up. Did Mayors. you have a follow? Go. Yes. Well, you know, you worked in the firm Davis Polk for nine years, and at the end of that tenure, you were hardly a young junior. You were a major player advising those tobacco firms, and this is documented. There's a book, 2010, Take Back America, that devotes one whole chapter on your career at HUD and with these tobacco firms, and you're now saying that that's fiction. How come I, I you didn't sue that? How come you didn't sue the libel? You. you should have sued the author for libel. Don't believe everything you read. <laughs> okay. All right, let's move on. It is time now for our second round of questions from our panel, and uh, we begin now with Devlin Barrett, who has a question for uh, Mr. Diaguardi. Devlin. Thanks, Mr. Diaguardi. Your main credential in running for Senate is your experience as an accountant, saying you feel your responsibility is to balance the nation's books. If accounting is your strength, how do you explain the problems the Federal Election Commission and the IRS found in your book bookkeeping? Are you talking about... I'm talking about the, the FEC uh, complaint uh, related to the, the car dealership in Westchester. Yeah, that... Okay, start with that. That was an individual on my finance committee. He did something wrong. When I saw it in the papers a month before our election, I'm the one who wrote the letter to the FEC to investigate that. I had nothing to do with it. It then became the subject of Nita Lowy running against me in 88, putting in $250,000, non-reporting, she got fined a year later, just to make this into something it was not. I had nothing to do with it, I was never fined, and she was. And what about the IRS issue with the argument over deductions? Okay. You know, I must have filed 50 tax returns. One return was audited, and the IRS tried to apply rules from 1986, the 86 Reform Act, to 1978. I was a tax partner at Arthur Anderson. I wouldn't let the IRS bully me. I kept them at bay from 1978 to 1992, and when I threatened to go to tax court, they cried uncle because they didn't want that as a precedent, and we settled. A minor amount of taxes, no penalties, no nothing but interest and taxes, and that's done all the time. A routine audit. Okay. Ms. Gillibrand, did you have a rebuttal? 
these are just serious questions that voters have a right to know about. Um, they're serious issues that certainly go to credibility, accountability, and transparency. And I think they're important. And my life's an open book. Uh, all right. Thank you all. Uh, it is uh, time now for Juan Manuel, who has a question for Ms. Gillibrand. Thank you, Roma. Um, Senator, for decades, many in your own party, in the Democratic Party, tried to pass a health care reform. Uh, so why do you think that this year, uh, many candidates from your party are running away from it or even running against it? Well, my view is that the health care reform bill made a difference, and it's actually going to help reform how we deliver health care in this country. Uh, right now, what we passed were common sense reforms that most people agree with. Tax cuts for small businesses so they could afford to offer health insurance. Closing the donut hole for seniors so they can afford medications. It's about $2,000. Making sure there's more uh, competition, having an exchange of not-for-profits and for-profits so that we can drive competition and drive down prices so it's more affordable. And last, real insurance reforms, telling the insurance companies you cannot drop coverage because of pre-existing conditions. You have to cover kids until they're 26 and you must cover preventive care. Because one of the most urgent issues we have right now is we must move this country away from an emergency room based system into a preventive so care Senator, system. Let me try again. If Go ahead. the reform is so great, why do you think many candidates in your own party are running away from it or even against it? I think a lot of folks don't understand what's in the health care bill. I just took 45 seconds to describe what's in it, but a lot of times all somebody will cover is one soundbite. And so to describe each of those good reforms, when you have the chance to do that, when I've met with voters, no matter who they are, they say, those are reforms that are needed. I want those reforms. Those are things I appreciate. I think it's just sometimes difficult to explain that in the so quick your, sound bites of today's your media. Your colleagues in the Democratic Party, they'd rather not explain it. Um, they'd rather go against it than explain it. I can't speak for them. I don't know what their views are. But my view is it's a good reform. It's a good bill. It's going to bring down costs for every, everyone. And it's going to change how we deliver health care into preventive care. The biggest thank you. Okay, thank okay. you. Mr. Yeah. DeWarty. Yes. Now, you know, this bill did nothing to reduce the cost of health care. If the Democrats wanted Republicans at the table, they would step on their third rail, which is tort reform. They didn't even mention it. Why? We got 57 lawyers in the Senate. She's the 57th lawyer. I'd be the second certified public accountant. So you can make your choice on that. Over 250 lawyers in the House. There's a tremendous special interest group outside called the legal profession. Turn on your TV set at night. Were you in an accident? Even if it was last year, are you still feeling pain? Did you trip? Oh, we just got a settlement, eight million bucks. This is causing doctors to do tests they don't need to do, filling their files with expensive MRIs on the basis that someday they may get sued. This bill did nothing to reduce the cost of health care. Worse, time is and up. why they're running away from it? Mr. Look Diagardi. at the insurance premiums going up around the state. Thank time you. is up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, time now. We uh, go to Aaron Billups uh, with a question for uh, Mr. Diaguardi. Mr. Diaguardi, there was a lot of criticism over the appointment process that put Ms. Gillibrand in office. New York has a system for special elections when it comes to filling vacancies in the state legislature. Should that same system be adopted for filling vacant U.S. Senate seats in the future? And what's the system you're talking about? In the legislature, there's a special election system. Uh, okay. Well, that, that might be fair. I, I don't think that we should just have an appointment. I think there should be a special election. I think it's important for the people to speak as soon as they can when it comes to filling a spot as important as the U.S. Senate. But there's a lot of other things that have to be reformed. Look at redistricting in, in our state. Look at the lack of independence. Look at how computers are now calming up districts so we don't have really uh, independent people coming in. People that are wedded to their parties because they've put more Democrats in with Democrats, more Republicans in Republicans, and very few seats are in play. This is a crisis for us. So I would say that on your question, definitely we should have a special election. Ms. Gillibrand, is it fair that you served for almost two years in the U.S. Senate because one person picked you? 
Well, this is the process that our state has, and in fact, this is the special election. This is the opportunity for New York voters to decide who they want to be their senator. And this election is all about who we fight for and how we're going to address real problems that New Yorkers are facing. And the biggest issue right now is the economy. And people want to know what are you going to do to turn the economy around and create jobs. And that's why I've been focused on small business lending and small business tax cuts and helping middle class families get by and making sure we stop outsourcing in this country. But should it be sooner? I think the process is fine. I don't think it is. And look at how unfair it is to someone like me. She's been running around now for two years with Senator Schumer amassing millions of dollars. Uh, they both went to Wall Street and before they shot Wall Street in the foot and then Wall Street said don't come back here anymore, she had amassed over 10 million bucks. Now you have someone like me who wants to compete Hey, you know, it's not easy to go through a primary, come out on September 14th, and in less than two months, I have to go against someone who's had two years to prepare. So I think, forgetting about my race in particular, you raise a very good issue, that there should be a special election right from the beginning. All right. Uh, thank you, Aaron. And uh, now we go to Liz Benjamin, who has a question for Ms. Gillibrand. Ms. Gillibrand, um, Hillary Clinton once pledged to create 200,000 jobs uh, for New York while serving in the U.S. Senate. And actually, while she was serving in the Senate, the state lost about 35,000 jobs. So how many jobs specifically can you say that you've either directly or indirectly had a hand in helping to bring to the state uh, since you inherited this seat from, from Senator Clinton? And how many more might be realized if you were actually elected to fill out her term? Mm -hmm. I don't think you could ever say how many jobs have been created. I think it's a question you fact really can't answer. But what I know is I've been working on is how to create those jobs because the bottom line is government doesn't create jobs, people create jobs. What creates a job in New York State is the entrepreneurialism and innovation of individuals who have a good idea, a good product, a good service that they want to sell to the American people. And so what my job is is to facilitate that entrepreneurialism and innovation by making the landscape possible for them. The biggest challenge right now all across New York is access to capital. I can't tell you how many small businesses have said, I can't get a loan. If I can get a loan, the interest rate's, rate's too high. And I, I just, I never, I've always had a line of credit and it's just been canceled. So passing a lending bill has been my biggest priority. And we just passed a $30 billion lending bill that goes straight to the community banks and urges them to lend. We also passed a package of tax cuts for small businesses so that they can also invest in their business. Tax cuts for every new job given, tax cuts for startups, tax cuts for investing in property, plant, and equipment. So, so just to be clear, you, you don't think it's appropriate for an elected official to say, or, or a candidate to say, I can bring this many jobs to a state? I don't think it's possible to tell how many jobs you've created. I think it's so difficult. Um, but what I do know is that there are ways to offer solutions for New Yorkers that want to create those jobs. So for example, I have an, uh, an agenda that's focused on both manufacturing and agriculture. How do you create jobs for manufacturers? How do you make it more cost efficient for them to produce the goods they're producing? And so that's what this is about. And so I think what is better done is to ex describe your vision for how you're going to try to make it easier for companies to create jobs. But I think it's not possible to actually say how many jobs have been created because of your policy. I know that the number one thing we should be doing to create jobs in this, in this state, in this country right now, is getting access to capital into our small businesses because it's the number one issue that small businesses have told me that they're struggling with. So Hillary Clinton should not have said that she could create 200,000 jobs. That was her decision, but from my perspective, I don't think I can say how many jobs these ideas will create. I know they will make a difference because it's what the small businesses have asked me to do. Mr. Diaguardi. Well, you know, you've been here two years, uh, Senator. And in those two years, we've lost 160,000 jobs. Since you voted for the stimulus bill, we lost 125,000 jobs. And just today, the labor report came out that New York State lost another 15,000 non-farm jobs. So obviously, your report card is not good. Not only did you not create jobs, we've lost many jobs. And you've got to be aggressive about what you do to change that. And one of the things is we're in a toxic environment in this state, mainly because of your party. The Democrat Party is dysfunctional in Albany. They created a wonderful report called the Task Force for Diversifying New York's Economy. It was issued on December 14th. I found it. It's wonderful, but they're not implementing it.
Time, As a senator, up. you could have played a role in trying to implement that report and creating the infrastructure Mr. and reducing Diaguardi, the taxes. Mr. Diaguardi, the time you did not. is up. All right, thank you all. Uh, it is time now for our lightning round in which uh, I ask questions that can only be answered with the words yes or no by the candidates. Both candidates are required to answer the questions and uh, I will rotate who starts. Uh, this, uh, we begin with Ms. Gillibrand. Has the Tea Party movement been good for America? Yes or no? Ms. Gillibrand? No. Absolutely. Okay. Mr. Diaguardi, should sugary drinks be taxed? You know, I think... <laughs> oh, yeah. No. Okay. Ms. Gillibrand? No. Ms. Gillibrand, have you ever texted or used a cell phone while driving? No. No. Ms. Mr. Diaguardi, should victims of rape and incest have the right to choose abortion? <laughs> funding? Uh, we're talking about a funding issue or just, yeah. It, Should it, they? It, it, rape, incest, death of the mother? Yes, those exceptions I would agree with. Okay. Except for funding. Ms. Gillibrand? Yes. Ms. Gillibrand, should Andrew Cuomo debate Carl Palladino one on one? No. Absolutely. Okay. Why not? What's that? We're doing it. Yeah. That's our choice. <laughs> That's All right. their choice. <laughs> Mr. Diaguardi, should the Guantanamo Bay prisoners be tried in military tribunals instead of U.S. criminal court? Yes. No. Uh, Ms. Gillibrand, should the New York City commuter tax be restored? No. No. Mr. Diaguardi, should Alan Hevesy, the disgraced former state controller, go to prison? Yes. Ms. Gillibrand? It's a prosecutor's decision. Yes, no? It's a prosecutor's decision. Right. I, I don't have the evidence in front of me. All right. Well, he's already been convicted. Ms. Gillibrand, should smoking be banned uh, at state and national parks and beaches? Yes. Yes. Mr. Diaguardi, would David Patterson make a better U.S. Senator than Governor? No. <laughs> Ms. Gillibrand? No. Ms. Gillibrand, would you, if invited, attend the groundbreaking for the Islamic Cultural Center and Mosque near the World Trade Center site? Yes. Mr. No. And uh, Mr. Diaguardi, would Hillary Clinton make a good vice presidential candidate in 2012? That's my choice? Okay. <laughs> uh, could be. Yes or no? No. Yeah. <laughs> Ms. Uh, Ms. Gillibrand? Yes. Ms. Gillibrand, would you like to see congestion pricing established in New York City? No. Yes. Mr. Diaguardi, did Anita Hill tell the truth? No. Yes. And our final question, Ms. Gillibrand, is the rent too damn high? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mr. Diaguardi. I agree. Okay. All right, that concludes our uh, lightning round, and we are going to start a third round of questioning and try to get in as many uh, more questions as possible before closing statements. So and I will begin with a question for Mr. Diaguardi. Uh, much has been made recently about your opponent's appearance. Uh, we saw the article in uh, Vogue, or the story in Vogue magazine with that glamorous photograph. Um, we've heard about her weight loss. Uh, even the, the Senate Majority Leader reportedly made a comment about her appearance. Is any or all of this appropriate? Let me put it this way. Do you want a senator that strikes a pose? Or do you want a, a senator that's a certified public accountant to protect <laughs> the bottom line and preserve the American dream for the future? But, 
would you answer the question though, is it appropriate to be talking about her appearance? Well, you know, human nature being what it is, what we see we like to talk about, and I don't think I would shut down that. Do you feel there's any double standard at play here? Between us? The fact that we're talking about her appearance and not yours. Uh, you know, I don't think so. All right. Ms. Gillibrand, do you have any comments? I think it's irrelevant. Candidates should be judged on their merits, on what their vision for creating jobs in New York. Uh, but these kinds of issues are, are ones that are real. Because in fact, a lot of women don't choose to be in public service because of it. And we need more women in government. We only have 17% women in the House and in the Senate. And when you have more women serving, you have more role models. And what I've had in my life are real role models. I had a grandmother who loved public service and focused her efforts on getting women involved. Hillary Clinton was a role model when she gave her speech in China and said, women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights. So we need to address the issue because we need more women in, in government. And women make a difference. Women can solve problems. They are very good at consensus building, bringing people together. Right. And what we need are people who will go to Washington and fix it and find solutions. All right. I agree. I had a very strong mother. I have a very strong wife. And I helped create a very strong daughter, Kara. And I think that we should have many, many more women in government. All right. Uh, we have to move on, and I ask if uh, we could keep the questions concise and the responses concise. We want to get through a third round before we uh, go to the closing statement. So we want to uh, begin again with our panel and Liz Benjamin, who has a question for Ms. Gillibrand. Um, Ms. Gillibrand, uh, after spending time working for Andrew Cuomo at HUD, you have actually a unique view into his management style, um, which has come under criticism of late from uh, people who worked for him under uh, at the State Attorney General's office. So what, if anything, would you say that Andrew Cuomo needs to do to improve his management style if and when he's elected governor? I think Andrew Cuomo, our Attorney General, has an excellent management style. He's a strong manager, he's a leader, he's someone who has a vision for where he wants to take the state. And this state is in a crisis. We have some of the toughest problems that any state has had to deal with. We have budget deficits from here to the eye can see, and it's going to take strong leadership, and it's going to take the ability to create a vision and to implement it. And when I worked for Mid Hud, he was very good at that. Uh, he was the first person who ever used the Fair Housing Act as a way to stamp out racial injustice. In fact, he was the first to ever file a lawsuit against the Ku Klux Klan for discriminatory practices and won a million dollar judgment. So that's the kind of leadership and vision that I think our state needs and I think he will bring that to be able to deal with the very, very tough problems that we have. So no improvements at all? I think his strong management style will help. These are tough problems and I have full confidence that he will be able to take them on one by one. Liz, I would wish they would have had a one-on-one -on -one debate, and, and probably several, because he was in charge of HUD at the time that uh, Senator Gillibrand joined him. And they were the ones that were charged with in, in implementing the Community Reinvestment Act. And basically, and, and this is a record, they put from 42% to 50% the amount of mortgages that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac had to buy to put low-income people in houses, but they put people in there without documents and without jobs. Could, I think Andrew Cuomo should be accountable for that. Okay. Could I just interrupt for one second quickly, though? This is more about the standard bearer of the party going in towards the gubernatorial race, and since you've brought up Carl Palladino, I know you have embraced him in the past. I'm just curious. I didn't bring him up. You did. Well, you said there should be one-on-one -on -one debates. Were oh, okay. you not speaking of? Yes. Um, you have embraced Carl Palladino in the past. You've said that you'd support him for governor. Give, in light of everything that has happened in recent weeks, do you still believe he could be an effective governor and leader of the state of New York? Well, let him continue to make his case as he did in the primary, as I did. We were not chosen by our party. We had to go out and get the signatures. We had to go into a primary process late in September, and we survived that. I would let him continue to make his case to the people and let them choose whether or not they want him as a governor. Do, as do they you want, still continue to support to him? Excuse me? Do you still continue to support Carl Palladino for governor? Are you asking me whether I would vote for him? I'm asking if you still consider, continue to support him. I would vote for him. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, Aaron Billups now has a, a question for, um, is it 
Mr. Mr. DiGuardi, yes. Mr. DiGuardi, the House is expected to pass the Fair Elections Now Act, which would require public funding for campaigns, a four to one match for small donations. Proponents of the bill say it would level the playing field between rich and poor candidates and between those backed by big money and those who are not. Is this a bill you would vote to pass in the Senate and why? Not in that version. I don't think we should use public money per se. But what can be done is to look at the most expensive part of campaigning which is these te television ads to get your message across. You know, the FCC grants licenses to these companies. Why not, as part of that, make it appropriate for them to allow airtime, equal airtime, for candidates and get away from this mindless amount of money that's being spent on TV ads and consultants? I don't want to see direct public money, especially now that we are borrowing from China to balance our books here to go into this process. Ms. Gillibrand. I have very significant concerns about the amount of money that's being thrown into campaigns all across the country with no accountability. Taxpayers, voters have no knowledge of who's paying for these ads or why, whether it's coming from abroad, whether it's coming from special interest groups, whether it's coming from uh, big oil. These are the issues that are really facing our country. So what we need is we need to pass this bill because this bill makes sure there's 100% transparency. What we need to see is that when when an ad is run, at the end of the ad, we need to know who paid for it. We need to know the CEO has to approve the ad and say he's paid for this ad. Or if it's a special interest funding group, the number one donor needs to be proven. We need to make sure that these ads are not being paid by foreign countries. We cannot have the influence of foreign countries on our elections because that is part of our constitution and what we believe in. Foreign countries are not involved in this right now. That's just How would you know? Right. No. There's no disclosure. Time is up. Uh, we <coughs> only have about 60 seconds left, so we have time for one more question, but we're going to have to limit the, the responses to about 30 seconds. Juan yes. Manuel? Really quick. Uh, Senator, um, here in our state, um, on Amtrak trains, uh, the Border Patrol routinely checks and asks passengers uh, for papers. Those who cannot prove their legal immigration status are taken away. Do you think this practice makes is safer or does it amount to tactics of a police state? Um, I, what I think is very important are these are the kinds of issues that must be addressed in comprehensive immigration reform. When you leave enforcement, but in the meantime, would you stop? There these should be a, yes, and and the reason you, you, you can do checks, but you have to make sure there's no racial profiling. You have to make sure um, uh, that it's not being abused in any way. But it, you can do checks at the border to make sure illegal drugs border, aren't on coming Amtrak in. Trains, mm -hmm. On Amtrak trains, on Amtrak trains in New York State. Mm -hmm trains that are going from Rochester to New York City. These uh, checks are I don't think are checks should be used for immigration enforcement because then you're leaving a state-by-state -state analysis of how to enforce immigration laws. Thank I you. would far prefer that you do that on the federal level through comprehensive immigration Mr. reform. Diaguardi, Mr. Diaguardi, do you have a response? I think that would open the door to other things that would not be American. I think we have to enforce the immigration laws at the employer level. There are many employers exploiting immigrants who are here illegally, and that has to be changed, and those laws have to be enforced. Thank you. All right. I'm sorry, <laughs> Devlin, but uh, we have to move on. Uh, that's all the time for questions now from our panel, but uh, we do have uh, some brief time for closing remarks by the candidates. Uh, each of you will have a 60-second time limit, and we begin with Ms. Gillibrand. Washington is broken. We need people who will fight for reform, who will fight for independence, and far more transparency and accountability. That's why I've made transparency and accountability one of my most significant issues. I was the first member of Congress to ever post my earmark requests, all the meetings I take, and to make sure that we have financial disclosures online. I'm trying to continue that as a senator. I now have a bipartisan bill to make sure that all earmarks in the Senate are searchable in an online database. I want to end the anonymous holds where any senator can stop legislation and not move bills forward and I want to make sure we reform the filibuster process because at the end of the day we have to get America's business done this election is about who we fight for and it's about how we're going to turn this economy around and what we need are people who are going to fight for small businesses for middle-class tax cuts for an R&D tax credit that unleashes the entrepreneurialism and innovation of our small businesses and our great minds all across New York we need to stop outsourcing good American Time. jobs because I want to see Made in America Time again. Is up.
Mr. Diaguardi. Well, Senator Gillibrand has had her two-year tryout, and I believe she has flunked. Jobs have been lost. She has disguised who she is in many ways, and I think it's time to give Joe Diaguardi a two-year tryout. <laughs> That's all this is. I'm not running for six years. And what kind of senator would I be? Well, you know, I'm going to be the kind of senator that will not tell you what you want to hear, like Senator Gillibrand, I believe, has done. I will be the kind of senator that will tell you what you need to hear. America needs transparency, business needs independence, and the people need a certified public accountant to protect the bottom line so we keep the American dream alive. Your vote for me will permit you to see an America for what it was intended to be. Right. A government of the people, by the people, and for the people. All right. Not a government that deceives Time. the people, controls the people, and buries them in debt. Vote for me, Time change the status quo, protect the American dream. Thank you. Thank you all. That does conclude tonight's debate. I want to thank our panelists, of course, and the candidates for making this a, a lively and very okay. interesting evening. And of course, we'd all like to thank the Sage Colleges for allowing us the use of this Bush Memorial. Yes, thank you. Just finally, just finally, our next debate for the U.S. Senate between Charles Schumer and Jay Townsend will be Sunday night at 7 o'clock, and we welcome you all. Uh, it will be brought live to you from Marist College in Poughkeepsie. Again, thank you all. Have a very good night from Troy, New York. And that's it for tonight's U.S. Senate debate. Thank you for joining us here on News 12. You can watch tonight's debate plus all of our expanded election coverage on Channel 612 on your IO Digital Cable Box. We'll be right back with more in just a moment.